browser. Even if it is headless, you need to have it and that would result into slow test execution. Having one UI test to ensure that the recipe uh, has been successfully created is certainly the requirement, but that is not a scalable approach to, um, to probably check your recipe's listing page. And yeah, so via the UI, it took me approximately 20 seconds to create just one recipe. And I'm just talking about the recipe content type here and not the associated uh, uh, fields in the recipe, like for example, taxonomy terms or tags, right? So those were already present in the system. Just creating a recipe took me 20 seconds. Okay, I'll hand over to Akanksha for next few slides. Thank you. All right, let's get our hands dirty. Uh, let's create the data. So what do we need? First, we need test data. And second, we need this data every time that we run the test. So we should be able to create, the, create this data while running the test. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, OK, so the first part, the first step would be creating the data. The second, we need a method to export this data so that it's available in the config or you know in the code and not in the database. The third is to create a test module for shipping this data with our tests. And finally, we need to run the test. So when we run the test, we import this data, data gets created, we run the test, and then we delete this data so that our environments are clutter free. Let's see how we can do this in Drupal. So all right, so first step, creating the data. Now, there are multiple ways to do this. What we'll be talking about today is devil and devil generate, plus realistic dummy content, and then the drush commands to do all of this. First, let's talk about devil and devil generate. So these are two modules which are very useful for developers. You, and the best part is that there's a UI for creating dummy content through devil and devil generate. So once you enable devil generate, you'll see a UI where you can create test content. I will show this to you th right now. So you can create multiple, you can create multiple content types, nodes, taxonomy, menus, users, anything. It's very configurable. So you have an option to delete content and you have great control over, you know, when the node publication date should be, how many nodes to be created, whether to delete nodes or not. So this is what the UI looks like. You can generate the type of content that you want and we have, all right, so just a moment. Yeah, so we have all these options where you can select which content type to create, how many of these to create, and whether to delete all the pre-existing content types or not. Anyone can run this. You do not need to know code to do this. But the content that is created with devil and devil generate, it uses default lorem ipsum text, which does not look great. And this is where realistic dummy content comes in. Realistic dummy content supercharges devil and devil generate to create actual content. And it adds images from like open source images so that your content looks great. All right, so I have a video here. Uh, so even in HTML fields, basic formatting is added so that it looks actually like the content that someone would go in and create and not something that is created by bots. Yeah, one sec, this is, mm, hold on, no, it's not, hold on, yeah. So as you can see, we are creating, con there is some pre-existing content in this video, and we'll go to the UI, which is inside configuration, devil, generate, and we have a bunch of options here. I'll be creating nodes, of the type article and recipes, 10 nodes, and we scroll down. So there are options. You can select what language you want it in, which user should be used to create this content, and there is an option to delete all the old content. Once we do this, this is extremely fast. So we already have all of these recipes and articles created, and everything that was there, was it, it has been deleted. And as you can see, the data is there in all of the fields. Now that we have finally created the content, it's time to export it. But first, let's also see 
how we can create this entire thing with Rush commands so that we can use it in tests. So there are Rush commands to generate all of this, Rush Gen C, and then you can generate whatever you want, either menus, taxonomy terms, users, vocabs. Uh, also, the kill command is the UI option that you saw to delete all the old content. So if you put the kill option, then all the old content would be deleted. There are a bunch of other options. So you can skip fields, you can add languages, feedback. So any of this can be used in your script to create test content. But each time, new test content would be generated. So this is not helpful for visual regression. We want the same test content to be generated every time so that we have baseline images, and then we can compare with those images. And that's when you know exporting and shipping the data comes in. And for this, we are using default content module. There are, there's another module called default content deploy, which is also great, but I'll be talking about default content today. So default content is a module with which you can ship default content to your site. It resides, so any default content that you have, it goes in the content folder of your module. And the benefit is that you can export everything as YAML files, including files. So images also get exp exported as YAML files, and then we can ex import all of this to run our tests. Uh, as you can see, that is my module.info file. You have to define every UUID that has been created with this module uh, in this file. The benefit of using this is that once you've created this, whatever content is created, when you disable the module, all of this content will automatically get deleted. There is a patch for this. It's not in the default module. Uh, all right, so we generate content with devil, devil generate, realistic dummy content, whatever you like, and then we export it with default content. So every time we enable this module, all of these uh, nodes, taxonomy terms, users, any entity would be created. And every time we disable it, it will get deleted. So now we can reliably run our tests with this content. Um, this is the command to export the content. So once you've created it, you can export with the node ID and to which, whichever folder you want. And finally, running the test. So this is a basic functional test that I've written. Uh, in the setup part, we are just installing the module. So as soon as you install the module, the entire content will get created. Uh, and when you disable the module, so I've also, there's a drush command to delete all the content that you created, which is DCD, and the name of the module. So anything that is created in the test content module would get deleted, and then the module will, would get disabled. It's a simple uh, test which gets the recipes page and verifies that the title of each node that we created exists on the view page. So once this runs, we go to the recipes page and it loops through the node titles and makes sure that everything that we created is now there on the website. So this was way faster than creating every node manually and then verifying it. Uh, this can also be run in the CI, like I've created a quick GitHub action to run it in CI. Uh, it does a basic install of the site with Umami, enables the module, and then runs the test. So we will get real-time feedback on every PR, whether it is working correctly or not. Uh, and I will pass it on to Shweta now. Okay, how many of you are aware of uh, automated visual regression tests here? Oh, that's that's a decent number. Yeah, so I so you might be aware that the primary challenge with uh, these sort of tests is that the data keeps changing or the data is dynamic, and um, uh, you know so in order to implement it, you need to understand how can the data be static and consistent across your different environments so that you can uh, leverage the maximum out of it. Or else you would end up in just verifying the layouts and not the content, right? So what happens is when your data is consistent, uh, consistent as Akanksha mentioned, by you know uh, just enabling your test module, 
So this is another quick video where uh, we've enabled uh, visual regression testing with Cypress. And here you see that uh, both the English and Spanish language uh, got validated in no time. So, so you see that you can immediately implement automated visual regression tests. And the bigger advantage is also certainly that your functional tests reduce drastically uh, because uh, you don't have to sit and assert all the tit titles for all the recipes. You don't have to verify their tags and all of it, right? With visual regression, it gets validated. The functionality gets validated as well apart from the UI. So let's talk about uh, good practices with test data management. That's what TDM stands for. Yeah, so good test data should allow you to exercise and validate high value user journeys. So that's a given when it comes to end to end uh, test automation. Ensure that uh, the highest, the highly used user journeys are exercised in your automated suites. And you don't use dummy content, uh, as Akanksha mentioned, that the realistic dummy content would help you to have content that is closer uh, uh, to how the real user would be using it or uh, consuming it. So ensure that this is there in your practice. Validate edge cases. Obviously, don't forget the edge cases also. Have uh, data planned so that your edge cases are exercised as well. Uh, your test data, with the help of test data, you should be able to reproduce defects uh, as soon as they are caught in uh, higher environments. You should be able to uh, simulate errors also. Uh, errors that are uh, probably caught in the production. Yeah, so externalize uh, test data using lightweight file formats like CSV or properties or YML. So we've been using YML here. Uh, the reason being, if you use Excel, then um, reading from Excel is quite time consuming. So ensure that you use lightweight file formats to store your data. Your data should always reside separately from your tests so that in order to, so that one is based on the test environment, your data might vary and you might have different data files in order to run your automated tests across different environments. And any changes to the data should not result any changes in the tests or in the automated test suite. So that's the reason why you need to externalize, externalize your test data. Yeah, so generation and destruction of uh, test data on demand for every test. Um, let's take a quick example of uh, probably adding new address, right? So the feature varies slightly for um, an existing customer and a new customer. For a new customer, you would have just like, you know, add primary address probably, right? And that button uh, wouldn't be visible for an existing customer. For an existing customer, it could be like, you know, add another address or add a secondary address, right? So you need to ensure that uh, you are able to create that new customer on fly using your setup activity and uh, ensure your uh, test for the new customer address and then tear it down. So your um, there shouldn't be any data dependency, any reliance on data for tests because another reason is that you n you should be in a position, you should be empowered to run your tests independently and in parallel. Also ensure that adequate test data is available to run the entire automated test suite before um, starting with automating uh, uh, the functionality for uh, or you know considering the use cases, ensure that the data requirements are well thought of and um, the data uh, is well captured and made ready and available provisioned for all the use cases and all the test scenarios for that particular function or feature. Yeah, your test data should not limit or constrain the automated 
tests that the teams can run for sure. Consider all test environments. Usually we have the dev, test, QA, or probably you test or QA, UAT. So whenever you are uh, structuring your data, just ensure that you are taking care of uh, the requirements. So data needs might vary. Um, some tests that can be run on uh, probably tests or lower environment cannot be run on pre-prod, for example. So ensure that uh, your data uh, requirements and uh, you consider all test environments before structuring your data. And, uh, and structure the data uniformly so that your scripts are not affected. So for example, usually you would store the URLs of different environments in different properties file, right? Uh, OK, account for localization as well. So uh, what I mean here is locale usually uh, constitutes of language and country. So there would be some data that is common across the locales. So that should be written just once. And data that is differing, uh, like the success and error messages based on different languages, should be captured in a different file. And data that is common should not be redundant. So you structure your files accordingly so that the data is not redundant uh, for the common parts of your localization. Yeah, the most important, the way your test automation suite uh, consumes data or how the data is managed in your project might vary from, uh, in your organization might vary from project to project. So ensure that documentation is in place so that the entire team understands how the data needs to be created, modified, destroyed, and how the test automation suite consumes it in first place. Talking about the anti-patterns, so yeah, so as I mentioned, an excessive dependence on uh, data defined outside the scope of the test, right? So for um, for tests that are dependent on data, like the address uh, test that I mentioned, you need to ensure that the scope of the data is within the scope of the tests. If you are going to uh, rely on uh, data that is outside the scope of your test, then that would result into fragile tests. Um, so for example, let's say if you are executing the, um, the address functionality, if you want to, if you are uh, restricted by executing tests in particular order, then that would result in fragile tests. So for example, you first uh, create a new user and then um, the add new address to it, and only then you can check the add secondary address feature, then you know that is, that is not going to give you any sort of flexibility. Yeah, and uh, dependencies on external data sources. So as I mentioned, if, you're gonna, if your data resides in Excel, then that's going to uh, bring in big performance issues with your uh, execution and it's going to delay the feedback of your application. Yeah, and copying production data, people usually feel uh, that, yes, it does give you certain insights, but then it might also contain confidential information. And hence, it's necessary that you mask all the sensitive data and not just blindly uh, utilize the production copy, the production database in your automated tests. And using obsolete or irrelevant information, uh, any changes, for instance, uh, to the fields of your content type, that should be reflected in your uh, data as well, so that you are not using obsolete or irrelevant information in your tests. Uh, even though uh, your tests might not fail, but uh, you need to ensure that the data is also modified when the content gets modified or when the functionality is modified. So let's understand the key benefits. Um, contribution to test automation by the entire team. Uh, certainly one of the major roadblocks why everyone in the team cannot contribute to test automation is people have this, uh, people have this understanding of it to be highly technical, which might not be true at all times. Uh, test automation is certainly a whole team 
responsibility and the entire team can contribute to it in several ways i can do a literally different talk on that but akanksha just explained that you know how uh, you know we are generating data in um, you know in a semi -te technical fashion in a user friendly fashion and uh, with this what happens is you actually empower your team to uh, think and begin with test automation quite early in the cycle um, wherein the team can focus on the data requirements of the functionality and need not worry about having those scripts always scream green yeah that's what people are really worried about when they begin with test automation that they want everything to appear uh, green all they have to do is once the data has been taken care of go to respective urls uh, so I'm talking about the act act column here. Either go to respective URLs and uh, add a visual regression assertion there. If it's a recipe listing page, really, they need not worry about any functional assertions also in that place. Reduce test authoring time. Certainly, uh, let's say that you have 10 recipes added and when you go to the recipes listing page, you'll have to sit and add an assertion for every every title, the tags, the media, and everything. And yet, there is no guarantee that the UI is intact, right? Just because your functional assertion passed. But uh, with visual regression, your test authoring time reduces drastically. You just go to the respective URL, and you assert uh, that the page looks intact. Your functionality gets automatically validated with it. No redundant steps, as I mentioned. You don't have to um, like even if you write a if, even if you write a loop for your functional assertions. Yet there's quite redundancy when your tests keep on uh, when you start when you move on to newer tests, next steps, ne next tests which are also related, but there would be redundant steps. Minimal functional assertions needed. I explained that. Cleaner and maintainable tests for sure, um, because your tests are modular um, and plus minimal lines of code, and so they are much more readable and cleaner. ROI is exponentially higher, and how we'll understand that? Data creation is a one-time investment, really. Uh, you wouldn't have to relook at it unless the feature has changed. UI validation across several browsers and devices. With this technique, since you can implement automated visual regression testing, you can validate the UI uh, across different browsers and devices. It doesn't have to be just one uh, browser. And we all know that when it comes to web apps in particular, uh, the releases are primarily delayed because uh, the UI needs to be verified across multiple browsers and devices. right? different viewports and that eats up a lot of teams time i don't think people should be engineers should be involved in verifying that manually functionality gets validated too it's not just the ui and returns multiply when the number of number of languages uh, to be addressed increase as well so with localization uh, the returns are certainly higher if you add four more languages here you can just understand the kind of um, a return you're going to get on a smaller inv investment. So it took me, what, around approximately 20 seconds to create one recipe via the UI, which means it would take me around 16 to 17 minutes to create 50 such recipes via the UI. Whereas it took me just 20 seconds to create 10 recipes, including all the related, all the metadata, that was the taxonomy terms and every users, everything. So I could create 10 recipes with metadata in 20 seconds. Yeah, so these are some useful uh, references where you can um, read about the test pyramid, the AAA pattern, and I have attached few public repositories, GitHub repositories as well, which is the end-to-end -end testing with Cypress and Drupal, automated visual testing using Drupal and Apply tools. So these are public repositories, the Cypress Drupal uh, repository, and um, yeah, some ways to improve test data management if you already have automated test suites running in your organization. 
uh yeah and uh, after the conference we'd love to stay connected via twitter and uh, linkedin and of course you can follow us on github as well time for q and a Yes, no, it does. We've got about five minutes for Q and A. Does anybody in the room have a question? Yes. Hold on a second for our viewers online. Uh, sorry, um, I'm relatively new to the subject, but I wanted to ask about the example that you talked about um, when there's um, either an existing customer that has to add an address. Um, or um, it's a new customer who doesn't have any addresses. And you said you would separate that out. I'm wondering if you could be a little more concrete about how you, how you would um, write your tests or manage your um, data so that you would have to, as you say, not change your tests when the data changes. Yeah, so do you see that there is a method called setup there, right? And that's where you take care of new customer creation, right? And so you're going to have a different test file for new customer, right? So that really depends on how you are going to uh, set up your test file, whether, whether the test file is going to consist of all tests for a new customer or is it uh, an address related uh, test file so that so the setup would differ accordingly but let's consider that you know we would have a uh, test for a new customer in this particular uh, file test file so the setup would consist of creating a new customer on fly on demand right and then you would have a um, so you have this uh, last method called test recip recipe listing page right so instead of that we would have a method called test uh, address for new customer or something, right? And that's where you would add uh, the step for clicking on the button and uh, the steps for adding the new address and asserting it. And in the teardown part, you just delete that customer, right? And so you can have more such tests written for new customers in the same test file where you can uh, generate the new customer in microseconds. Any other questions in the room? No? Yes? Yeah. Coming? Hi. Uh, I know you um, don't speak about uh, unit tests in your presentation, but um, I'm starting in my project to, to want to implement unit tests. And I'm wondering if you have a concrete example of a unit test uh, in Drupal, because it's like in the on the function level, level and ex is, um, there is services and function on services, but I don't know any other application to that. So do you have an example, concrete one? Uh, not in this slide, but after our talk, we can certainly look at the unit tests. Right, on our machine. This is not our machine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's my machine. <laughs> um, any other questions in the room? No? Okay, I'll just have a quick look and see if we've got any online questions. Yeah, sure. We just, go and, uh, just go and look at the uh, Q&A tab, if I can figure out. No, we have no questions. Okay, well, in that case, round of applause, and uh, thank you very much.